Welcome to It's Only Money here on Real Radio 104.1. I'm Ryan, and I'm here with financial advisors from Edgewater Family Wealth, Scott Brown and Tammy. That's right. EdgewaterFamilyWealth.com is the website you want to go to to get a hold of these gentlemen. And also we have links to past shows. There's a blog section. There's financial talks with Tammy. It is a wealth of knowledge, and it's all there at EdgewaterFamilyWealth.com. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you doing this fine, fine day? Good morning. As always, we're doing fine, fine. <laughs> fine, fine. That's doubly fine. Fine squared. Fine squared, indeed. Well, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a hectic week. It's been a fun week. I feel like I haven't seen you guys in ages. So. It's been a while. It's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> well, very cool. Happy to have you here. But now it's the first segment of It's Only Money, and you might be saying, "Wait a minute. What does that mean? What I think it means?" And it does. It means it's time for the numbers with Tammy. Oh, yeah, it's been a while since I heard that, too. Uh, now it's, it makes the day yeah, worth the, it. You know, you made what, his ringtone that. Yeah, it's going to be my wedding song that yeah. I walk down the aisle yeah. to, uh, just so you know. It's gonna be- <laughs> awesome. You can also find that song. Where, where, where can you find yeah. that song? Jamie just went full radio <laughs> DJ. He did. I heard that. <laughs> I like, what is that? Yeah, he's a, he's a radio DJ voice. I'm spinning the hits over here. <laughs> okay. All right, Wolfman Jack, what are the numbers? All right, so... Uh, numbers um so in florida i was looking um interestingly enough we see the mortgage rate went up 6.5 good news bad news again like anything else in the economy yeah but i thought well let's see what is the median housing price now if i am out to go out and do some shopping um, and uh, apparently it's about four hundred and sixty five thousand dollars in florida in florida yeah compared to Ooh. the national median which is four hundred and twenty seven so that's, you know, historically, Ryan, that hasn't been the case. Like when I was younger, much younger, um, it was commonplace for a person from the Northeast in particular to sell a home for, say, five or six hundred grand and say, they, you know, you know how there are a lot of older homes in the Northeast. You go up there, the oh, houses are yeah. built in the 30s and 40s, and they'd sell an old 2,000 square foot home, falling apart, wood place for 650, 700 grand, come down here and buy a Mediterranean. 3,500 square foot brand new Mediterranean for half that and then bank the difference. That was that was a common strategy amongst folks from the northeastern part of the country. That that ain't the case no more. No, not as common. No. Unless they own something in, say, Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, which prices we know, it never goes down there. No, the no is, matter. Even in COVID, they didn't go down. They, they, went, they dropped for a minute. Mm-hmm. Like my daughter was in school up there and I thought, wow, these prices have dropped. Right when COVID hit, like I want to say February, March, April of 20, we started to see the prices in Manhattan drop for a second. Mm. And I do mean a second, because like about three months later, they were back up and and beyond where they started, Uh, which, you know, it's not surprising that Manhattan real estate's expensive, but it was surprising to me how little it dropped and how quickly it rebounded. Anyway, I'm stealing your thunder here. Absolutely. No, no, uh, it's all shared, you know. Edgewater. We all do things as a team. Ah, <laughs> yeah, same at, team. A little, team. little bit of a pitch there. I like <laughs> it. So uh, year over year, we're up to about 16.5 mm. um, for Florida. And nationwide, we're about 14% up year to year. Year over year. Yes. So meaning if you went back 12 months ago, mm-hmm. uh, despite what I would suspect has been a recent drop off, a little, tiny little drop off, or is it just a drop uh, let me ask you this is the draw is there a drop off in actual prices recently or just a drop off in the expediency of the increase uh actually it's been a drop off like it went down prices went down went down yes um and you can see that when you compare it in how it is right now versus back in june yeah in june for instance the can you guess this now um, the median price in Florida was almost five hundred thousand. Wow! So we're down from five hundred to four sixty something. Four sixty something. Yeah, now. yeah. And nationwide, uh, nationwide. Sorry, it was four hundred and fifty, hmm. down to four hundred and twenty-seven. Yeah. So that's an important distinction, Ryan. Is you know when we say is that sometimes people say, well, the growth rate is down, meaning it's still growing. Mm-hmm. But it's just not growing as fast. But in this case, there's actually been a decline. Decline from the uh, max uh, when they had the top. You know where they use that a lot is the deficit and the debt, right? The politician oh, will come yeah. out and say, we've reduced the deficit. And people go, awesome. Finally, we're reducing. Wait, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> because they're reducing the amount of overage that they're spending. The amount they're spending over their budget they've reduced. But they're still spending over their budget, which means the debt is still increasing. It but is. the headline always says, 
when the politician would it doesn't matter what team they're on, red or blue, if they're in power, they say, Oh, we've reduced deficit spending. But you're still deficit spending. <laughs> so why should we feel good about it? Yeah, that? it's like it's like saying, like, the house is less on fire. Yes, yes. It's still burning over here, but that corner, not, not on now. fire. Not, no, not yeah. on fire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we fall for it. Yeah. Because even I hear it, I'm going, oh, that's good news. And they go, wait a minute. Anyway, yeah, but, but, less fire does sound better. Mm-hmm. It still burns you an equal amount. Yeah, <laughs> yes. You're just going to burn more slowly. Yeah, which I don't think is good news. No, no, yeah. no. But but again, if you own a house, good for you. If you're trying to get into buying a house, mm-hmm. uh, you might want to wait for a bit. But again, that depends on your strategy. After all, because mm-hmm. mortgage is up six point five, and some might argue that it's a good time to buy. Mm-hmm. See, because prices are down. Because prices are down, and although mortgage is up. Mm-hmm. But if mortgages are up, where is it going to go in like 10 years? Uh, mortgage rates. Yes, mortgage rates. Well, I mean, again, it's, it's, so we're getting into the trade versus investments, mm-hmm. right? You know, there's multiple factors when you buy a house. Rates, one of them. Prices, one of them. There are multiple factors. And in your region, depend. you know, sometimes uh, regions do better. Obviously, Witness Florida, we're doing a lot better than a lot of places in terms of how far we've fallen off mm-hmm. or not fallen off in this case. So I think it's. You know, we can talk, get into that real estate conversation, right? Some, you know, people, when they trade stocks, there's a, there's trading stocks and there's investing in stocks, right? The trader is, I'm going to buy a meme stock, not pointing any fingers. Mm-hmm. And that backfired. Yeah. <laughs> and it's all got that. Yeah. Yeah. So bought it a hundred bucks. And I think next week it's going to be 150. That's a trade. It's not an investment. You're not buying AMC because you think people are suddenly going to rush back to the movies. Right. You're saying I'm buying AMC because I think it's 100 and it's going to go to 150 because that's what they tell me on the Internet. So you do that. That's a trade. Uh, conversely, if you say I'm going to add, you know, 100 bucks a month or 500 bucks a month or whatever the number is, and I'm going to buy quality blue chip boring stocks that pay dividends. And on 30 years from now, I have a couple million dollars to pay me 50, 60, 70 grand a year in income. That's investing. Mm-hmm. Right. The same is true of housing. Right. Because we all know the house flipper. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm going to buy that house. There's a hundred shows on that home and garden television thing where somebody's buying a house for two fifty and flipping it in Vegas for four hundred, right? But they're not flipping it for four hundred because they've spent a hundred grand fixing it up. They got to pay the real blah 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 blah. That's a trade. You're making a trade. In '08 was uh, basically our education why that doesn't always work because there were a lot of people looking for a chair when the music stopped, right? Everybody I knew was flipping houses. You get into an Uber. Or a cab at that time, because I don't even know if Uber was around. Yeah, I don't think it existed. Yeah, but you got in a cab, they're talking about flipping houses. You go to the coffee shop, they're talking about flipping houses. You go, I don't care where you went, flipping houses was the discussion I saw it on my street. People buying it, selling it, buying it. And it worked for a couple of years, and then 208 hit, and a lot of people were destroyed. Destroyed because they had four houses that they bought for 500 grand, and now they were worth three yeah. in the open market. And they just walked away. A lot of people just walked away from those houses. So that was a trade. They were trying to do a trade. They weren't investing in those homes. They weren't saying, I'm going to spend 250 I'm going to put 50 into it so it's nice. A nice family can move into it. A nice young family, they can pay me rent. That rental help pay down my mortgage. And 30 years from now, I'll be paid for. And that rental will go directly in my pocket. That's investing, right? That's different than flipping. I am by no means saying you can't flip houses and be successful. What I am saying is it's less likely uh, than if you invest in a home uh, that you're using as a rental property 20, 30 years down the road. Yeah. When I watch those home flipping shows, <laughs> yeah. it, it's I, it's just like, how how are you making money? Because yeah. <laughs> I, 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 my dad did it for a long time and he, he, he wouldn't flip them. He would just ha- have them, hold on to them. And then he recently had to liquidate everything because he's a he's almost 90 i think he's 90 now yeah uh and and that it all that was all his money and it was it ended up being great but it was a lot of like uh a lot of work and a lot of and uh we would go in and fix these houses and it was like damn why don't you just sell this you can sell this house and he'd be like nope that's not what this is about so it does work. <laughs> no, he got it. I mean, he got it. He's like, he understood it was work. That's where people go wrong is when they think this is easy. You know, mm. whenever you say to yourself, this is easy, it probably won't work. 
No, there never seems to be like there's people that get that get lucky is what I've noticed, but it's never uh, the people that I know that have money. It's never like yeah, it's totally like barely did anything <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, with that voice yeah. always. Yeah, like, <laughs> there's there's no movie about a guy who is yeah, I didn't do anything, and uh, you know I'm a billionaire. I just I was sitting on the couch <laughs> watching television. Exactly. There's no nobody. That's not a thing. <laughs> no, and they might get lucky for a minute. Mm -hmm. Right. And the problem with luck is you think you confuse it with skill. So mm -hmm. so in Vegas, people know the people that run Vegas, the secret people who run Vegas. They know that a person who wins their first hand of blackjack will literally lose twice as much money over their stay mm. as if they lost their first hand. And why is that? Because now they think they're good at blackjack. Yep. They drew the king and the ace. Clearly, that's because they're very smart. Yeah. Yes, of course. That's so then they spend the rest of their trip. Spending thousands of dollars trying to recreate that feeling. Yep, that's what I did with meme stocks. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I crushed it right out the gate, and I was like, obviously, I'm very good at this. And then I threw away more money doing that. So I should not. I even I remember we first started this show. I was like, you would tell me like, Ryan, that's not a good idea. And I'm like, you don't know, Scott. <laughs> you don't know. Turns out you're right. You know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, if you want to talk to Scott and Tammy and get good advice, that's where you want to go. Edgewater Family Wealth. Dot com is the website. That's how you contact these gentlemen. And we'll be right back with more. It's only money here on Real Radio 104.1. Welcome back to It's Only Money here on Real Radio 104.1. I'm with Scott Brown and Tammy from Edgewater Family Wealth. EdgewaterFamilyWealth.com is the website. I'm Ryan, and it's a beautiful day, uh, at least in the studio. It's a, it's a beautiful Gorgeous day. in here. Yes, <laughs> with ACs a kicking. Yeah. Uh, Scott, uh, Look, I don't want to tell you how to do your job, no. okay? Uh, but it seems like you're giving away a lot of important information uh, that's really good and has really helped me just for free on the radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always assumed that, uh, like, money guys, they're like, they, they, they hold their secrets, yeah. right? Like, you, you, you hold them in and you don't tell anybody and then you, then you profit, right? right? And, then you, and then at the end of the day, you just twiddle your fingers together like yep. Mr. Burns yep. and, you, and you laugh at all the people because they don't know the secrets that you have. And uh, I, I just, I gotta say, I don't know if people are going to edgewaterfamilywealth.com because they're getting the info here. Ah, see, I'm really bad at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, some people see life as a zero sum game, right? It's, you know, it's the, first of all, you know, like you, you have that friend that they always, they go to the, buy their car and they stick it to the dealership. Like, yeah. I oh, stuck yeah. it. That poor guy. He didn't even see me they coming. did not know what I, he was up against. Cause I'm that guy. I'm negotiation guy. Right. Like, first of all, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. You, nobody's ever walked out of a car dealership. The winner. Mm -hmm. You don't win that game. Maybe you did. You saved a hundred bucks and you got a t-shirt out of them, but you <laughs> didn't win. They're not selling you a car at a loss, no matter what you think. So that's first and foremost. But I think that, you know, in this country, it used to feel like, and I'm going to do an old man thing now, mm -hmm. uh, but it used to feel to me like when I'd see my grandfather, who was a farmer, negotiate with people for oranges or watermelons or potatoes or whatever he was selling cattle. And, you know, the people got along like there was a, the, the whole look them in the eye, shake their hand. I'm going to come back and do business with you because you, you know, there was value in it. If you're doing a transaction and there's not value in it for both people, I think that's a limited thing. I mean, if you stick it to somebody and you really do stick it to them and they derive no value from that relationship, you're not going to you're only going to do that once. Right. You're not. It's not a relationship. It was a transaction. And you were unfair to the other person, right? So when you go in and, and and it used to be, I feel like when you talk to people, they'd be like, you know, is this fair for you? Yeah, I feel like it's fair for me. And the other person would say, yeah, I think I'm comfortable with this. And you would shake hands and when you go about your business, you both derive value. And then maybe, you know, two years or a year or six months or however long again, you see that person and they're like, hey, I got this thing. And you're like, oh, cool. My interaction with you was good last time. I derive value. You derive. Of course, you're not saying this stuff because that would be weird. But mm -hmm. you're thinking it, <laughs> right? And you're talking. You think, okay, I, you know, I remember Tammy. He did me right, and he made some money. I made some money, and that's cool. Um, that used to be how it felt to me. Like you know, business people were were looking out for each other um, as Americans or whatever, however you want to frame that. And I always felt like that was a pretty neat thing. I noticed uh, maybe about 20 years ago, and I wrote about this in the book that I noticed that started to change. I noticed that when I would interact with people uh, for business purposes and there was a transaction, whether it was a sale of a piece of property or a car or, 
or a TV or whatever it was, whatever the transaction was, they were going to give me a service. I was going to whatever the mentality, be, not for everybody, but for a lot of people began to turn towards zero sum. I am not going to do a deal with you unless I am the absolute winner. Meaning you got nothing out of it. I stuck it to you. I can go tell my buddies that I stuck it to you and be happy about that. Well, you can do that to me once. And it does happen to me because I am a person looking for value and to provide value, which is why I do this radio show this way. But if you do that to enough people, I believe that's the reputation you get. Okay. Yeah. That guy has a lot of money because he's a jackass, right? Is that really at the end of the day, do you want to be the jackass? You know, you could be a little less wealthy and not a jackass, I believe. So, you know, providing value in any transaction should be on your mind because that way people are reciprocal. If you're kind, I find if you're kind to people and you're generous with them before they've done anything for you, I find that human nature on average, some people just were born jackasses, Mm. um, (laughs) but I can't help themselves. Mm. They usually can identify those people pretty quickly. Um, but most people I think want to reciprocate. If you say, Hey, listen, man, while you're on vacation, I'll get your lawn or I'll pick up your mail or I'll water your plants and whatever. And no, oh, that's very nice of you. And then you go on vacation. It's the rare person that says, I ain't doing that. I don't care what you did for me. Right. It's the rare person that acts that way. And first of all, if you identify that person and you know, to stay away from them, right. Cause they're not interested. They're only interested in themselves and the value they get, which is to me, The most successful people I know are not that way. They're the opposite. They can't wait to give away information. They can't wait to tell you how they did. Oh, are you having a problem with that thing? I know about that thing. Here's what I think you ought to do. They're not asking for money. They're not asking for you to buy them a cup of coffee or anything. They're just like, hey, do this thing. I think that'll, and they get pleasure from that. I mean, think about, and again, I'm going to get preachy like I did last week, but think about, I try to tell um, my kids and my advisors that work for me, you know, You can magnify, you can expand your world of pleasure and happiness by enjoying other people's pleasure and happiness, right? If your whole day is spent, what's in it for me? That's an empty dead end, right? Because there's only so much of of this world, this life that is for you, right? Minimal at best. So I find that if, if whether it's through charity, whether it's through volunteering your time, whether it's mentoring a young person, whatever it is, there, is, there are ways to expand your world. And I will tell you that I firmly believe this, that somehow the universe provides to those that do that, right? There's infinite joy in doing that. And I think it's not just limited to karma or whatever you want to call it. It's, it can be economic, right? The odd part is some of these really kind, generous people with their time and their treasure, as people like to say, become amongst the wealthiest among. Again, I'm not saying there aren't a few Montgomery Burns characters out there. <laughs> I could name a few, but I'd get myself in trouble. Mm. Um, but on average, most of those people are very kind. That's that's so counterintuitive. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because it does seem like it should be a zero sum game. Because like you, if you want, if you like money, you want all of the money. Mm-hmm. But there's definitely I know like angel investors exist. Yep. Uh, things like that, uh, and they. You know, they just want their initial investment back. And then you find you end up like forming relationships more doing it that way. And then you never I guess this is going to sound worse. It's going to sound like it's like a for like what about me situation. But you never really know who's going to do what, you know, and somebody could end up becoming super like uh, helpful to you later in life. Yeah. And if you're a jackass, <laughs> yeah, they don't want to help no you. No one wants to help that. Like, I, and, you're, and you're absolutely right. Some people are just boring with the jackass DNA. They they are. And I know a few of them. But it's so interesting to see those people power through and be successful. Well, successful in a weird what, way. To what end though? <laughs> yeah, to what, to what yeah. end, right? Because if you're successful and nobody likes you, mm-hmm. I mean, that wouldn't feel I I'm a people person. I mean, I'm a social animal. I like people. Yeah. I don't want them to not like me. You know, I know people say, I don't care if people like me. I'm like, I'm not that guy. I want everybody to like me. <laughs> Please like me. <laughs> uh but you know, that's that's I, I I just don't get it if and I hate to be philosophical about it, but if you had all the money in the world and nobody you know nobody likes you, what's the point? You know, so I mean, I think zero sum games never work out because you find yourself you know if if Russia decides to nuke everybody and then there's one person left on the planet who's Russian, did they win? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fair enough. Sure. Why not? Sure. <laughs> we are the champ. 
Oh, we're not the I, champions. I we're am, the champion. I'm the one guy left. Uh, I'm going to celebrate my victory with no one. Yeah, you know? that should be fun. That's a good party. <laughs> it's like that episode of The Twilight Zone and the man's just alone. He finally has all the time to read the books and he steps on his glasses. Oh, oh. See, you don't want to step on your glasses. So <laughs> I would say if you're in a negotiation, certainly you don't want to be taken advantage of. I, I don't think that's what we're saying here. What I am saying is... I have always gone about my negotiations wanting the other person to benefit. Partially, it's just because I'm lazy in negotiations, but <laughs> also because I think it's you know it's just look if you're going to go buy a car and the car salesman's going to make a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks, I want him to make two hundred bucks. Like I want him to feel good about. Honestly, it. Honestly, yeah. When you put it that way, it's like super mean to go in there and be like, "Yeah, yeah I screwed this guy out of money. He, that's, now, now he can't get a full dinner. Uh -huh. No appetizer for him tonight. Only one of his two kids get to eat tonight. Yeah, you know? oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> go me. <laughs> I win. I win. And then mustache twirling again. Like, <laughs> yeah, there's not enough. You, you get. I'm surprised when I met you guys. No mustaches. No, no monocles. No top hats. Well, I have all that. I just don't wear it here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, That's what I want to see. You on a motorcycle, just riding through full top hat, monocle, mustache, blowing in the wind. Exactly. With a <laughs> one of those long cigar things or the cigarette things. No, but Edgewater Family Wealth, they that's that's their job. They're financial advisors, they're wealth Sherpas. We've talked about this before. They're 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 here to help you and uh not not to Montgomery Burns it. No, no. they they celebrate in the victory of you and your financial hopefully freedom. So there you go. Edgewater Family Wealth is the, the website dot com, of course. And then you know, they have all of the past episodes. We've got a ton of them. We talk about things from mutual bonds to the werewolf apocalypse. It's very fun. <laughs> Check it out. No, he's just making up words. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did one time. We talked about the only use of silver in the oh, apocalypse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Werewolves. Yeah. Because <laughs> you make bullets for werewolves. I always call them Wolverines for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> you would be very bad in a horror emergency. <laughs> like the Wolverines are coming. Oh, that doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> well, we'll be right back with more. It's only money here on Real Radio 104.1. Welcome back to It's Only Money here on Real Radio 104.1. I'm here with Scott Brown and Tammy from Edgewater Family Wealth. EdgewaterFamilyWealth.com is the website. Write it down. Mark it as a favorite because there is all kinds of great information, including past episodes of It's Only Money. We have the blogs. We've got financial talks with Tammy. It's a wealth, pun intended, of information. And... Uh, <laughs> I I am currently uh you know doing a lot of housework from picking up after the hurricane and everything and uh Scott I got to tell you man I got to stop buying cheap tools. <laughs> Why is that? Well, the problem with when you buy a cheap tool like I, like I can go get the you know the I call them the colors. You know, you mm. you you pick your color of mm. tools, right? Yep. And I'm like I could go to the the colors section whether it be red or green, yellow or blue, but I'm like I'm smart. I'm going to buy cheap version, save myself some money in the long run, but I keep having to, <laughs> they break, mm. they break and I keep having to buy them twice. And my fiance said this phrase to me, which I've never heard before, which is, and she said it with a, with a, I don't want to say smug. She's not smug. No, of course but not. it was, it was just, it was like, you know, if you buy cheap, you buy twice. Oh, nice. And I'd never heard that before. And it kind of blew my mind because <laughs> she's right. She is right. And you, what you got was a bargain, right? And they say a bargain is a price you can't resist for a product you won't use. Mm. Uh, there are stores. Uh, I won't mention any stores, but there are stores out there in parts of town that are built on that entire premise where you know things let's say they cost i don't know let me make up a number a dollar mm -hmm. things that cost a dollar right um, or below five dollars right let's say right. i'm not naming any names right <laughs> um where you go in that store you don't need any of that crap no. but it is below five dollars so let's just buy a bunch of it mm -hmm. right so there's there's the whole idea that that people will look at cost more than anything and price Price only matters in the absence of value. We get back to this value conversation we were having in the last segment is I see that in my world a lot. I see people who are like, well, what's the fee? That's always a warning sign to me when that's the first question they asked. And it's not it's not saying you shouldn't ask the question. I'm not saying you should be ignorant to the cost. Uh, you should be aware of the cost. But what you're saying is that is my primary motivation. And like you, I used to, I, I used to do that too when I was first a homeowner 30 some odd years ago. I'd go buy the drill, right? And I'm like, I don't really, I'm not a drill guy. I don't know anything about power tools, but I just need to screw in a screw. 
right? And I'd go buy the drill, and there, like you said, there'd be three or four or five of them, varying tiers, different colors. There's the crappy one up to the Mac Daddy one, and I don't know the difference. A drill's a drill, so right. I buy the cheap one because that's a cost for me, right? I whatever the cheapest cost is, and then I'd go home and I would try charge it and i'd be all excited i'm gonna put these screws in my wife's gonna be very proud of me I'm gonna mm -hmm. hang that picture i'm gonna Man. do it yeah yeah and so i'd get the drill and i'd stick it in the screw and i'd be like, nyeow, nyeow. i'm like all right this ain't working i go back and charge it some more i bring it back out nyeow. back to the store i'd go to get the one i should have bought in the first damn place right mm. so i was to me the priority was cost not value if i had just bought the, the one that was only ten dollars more to begin with I would have saved the $70 I had to spend to buy the second one, right? So people over in our country, I think people over, I say, I say that people go to college to learn to be an employee and to be a consumer, right? And we're taught that bargains are the way to go. Even if you don't need the crap, it's like, how can I not buy it? It's on sale. Well, it's on sale because it's crap, right? <laughs> yeah, nobody wants nobody it. Wants that it. is how it got to the sale rack, <laughs> right? So you know, think about if you go through your house and you look at all the stuff, like especially like in your garage or your shed or that drawer you never look in and look at all the stuff you couldn't live without. Right. And again, I'm not advocating for being a miser or a popper or not to buy consumer goods. I like stuff. I've said it a million times. I like stuff. And let's think about stuff. Right. So we we could talk about things like cars. Right. So you say, well, a car is a terrible investment. Well, that's true. That's true. It's a tr terrible investment. Uh, investment economically, but there may be intrinsic value to that, right? So if you're a car person, like I have friends, I'm a little bit of a car guy. I'm not over the top. I'm not not a car guy. I do like cars. I think they're cool. Um, certain kinds certainly appeal. I'm like, oh, that's a cool car, right? I, I get, I do that. But some guys are really car guys. Some gals are really car gals, right? And and they get value from like I've been saving. Somebody might say I've been saving. I've been saving. I spent. 80 grand on a Shelby GT that I found, right? An old 69 Mustang or something, right? You know, that's crazy. Why would you waste $70,000 on a 40 year old car? Well, that person gets something from that. It gives them peace of mind. It gives them enjoyment. Maybe when they're done working, they can't wait to go sit in that thing and drive around the neighborhood. You know, we've all seen that guy I live in College Park. There's a couple guys who have old Cadillacs. Mm. I don't know what year they're. I'm going to say there's vintage 60 something Cadillacs. They got the top down. He's got the big fins going. That guy could not be happier, right? He's cruising. Around. He's got his hand over the wheel, yeah. you know, doing the whole laid back thing. He's, he's, and that adds value to that man's life. Conversely, if you have somebody who's really doesn't love cars, but they're, they're like, well, what's the coolest car? I want all my friends to see me in this cool car. You know, and they go out and buy the $130,000 911. They don't really know anything about the car. They're not even sure where the key goes. They don't, they don't even like cars. They don't know how they work. Then that guy probably made a mistake, right? Yeah. But so you got to you got to say to yourself, where's the value? Is the value economic? That's one thing, right? Is the or is the value some kind of soul, you know, intrinsic value in your soul that makes you feel good that allows you to go build economic value, right? It's it's not one or you know it's not a again not a zero sum game. If your thing is travel, and you somebody says, well, you'd spent twenty grand going to Europe for three months you're being frivolous. That person might say, well, no, because I work my behind off the rest of the year so that I can go do that. That's where I find my peace. That's where I find my peace of mind. That's where I find my harmony. It's different for everybody. Um, my friends are all motorcycle people. We have a standing joke about how much money we throw away on motorcycle things, but we're really not throwing it away. It's, it's where we find our solace. We load up together. We ride out into the country somewhere in the southeast or maybe even colorado or something and we set up camp and we sit around the campfire and it's, it's there the most of the guys i ride with are engineers so we got a nasa guy we got a surgeon we got a nuclear engineering guy that does things i don't even understand right we have very thoughtful people who use intense mental power to get through their day and you would say well he's got a $17,000 motorcycle with all kinds of toys built into it. How frivolous. No, it's that toy that gives him the peace of mind to go do what he does and lets him relax. So again, these people who get caught up in absolutes, do this, don't do that. Well, one size doesn't fit all. Now we do know people, I'm not saying be a consumer, or, 
you know, overly interested in keeping up with the Joneses or having the best car in your driveway if you don't like cars or you don't care about cars, right? So, you know, again, it's it's what value am I getting from this economic or otherwise? And that's how I think you should approach those decisions. Mm. Yeah, my I have a neighbor. He's a Jeep guy, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean everything. It is it's the coolest stuff in his front yard. But it's like it's a lot of money that he's throwing in. I've talked to him, and he's like, "Yeah, but I'm in I'm in, I'm in the Jeep club. Mm -hmm. You know, we go on trips. It, it becomes my social circle and stuff like that." So it's a, it, and he's just like he's a computer IT guy. I believe it is. That's just that's it gives his soul filled. You know, but how do you as a financial advisor? They come to you. You're looking over everything. And then you see this expenditure and they're like, but, the, but my soul, you know, yeah, and, and, and yeah. you're like, well, is it really? Well, you, you can't do it at the expense because your soul won't be happy or fulfilled if you're broke. Right. Right. Because every, you your know, soul's not happy if you can't feed your stomach. That's right. <laughs> if you if you don't because that let's so let's talk about this. That's the trade off. Right. If you say, well, I really have always wanted a Ferrari. Right. And. But then you spend 200 grand on a Ferrari and then you can't save for retirement. So what you got in buying that Ferrari is being stolen back by the anxiety you're going to have for the next 20 years that you haven't saved for retirement. So, you know, don't live just in the moment. I'm not saying don't live in some moments, <laughs> but don't live just moment to moment. Right. You have to be thoughtful. So, again, it's a trade off. You may say I've always wanted a vintage car, a vintage Mustang or Corvette or whatever it is. Well, OK. Maybe you're not doing it today. Maybe first you get in place the, the platform that's going to build your retirement savings. You participate in the 401k or you buy a rental house or whatever it is you do. And then maybe instead of today, you do it in a year or you do it in two years. Um, and then you're, you're doing, again, absolutes just don't work. They, they just don't work in life. You know, I believe this and I don't believe that. Um, I'm, on, I'm, I'm in this political party because the other political, my party's good, their party's bad. Well, that right. ain't working so great for our country right now, right? Mm -hmm. Right? So- don't live in absolutes. Don't be an ideologue, whether it's, again, about economics or politics or anything else, right? Just, each thing has nuance. Be thoughtful about it, which, again, I know everybody wants a one-size-fits-all, do this, and everything right. will be great. <laughs> Not a Give thing. Give me the pill. I don't, need a don't, pill. Don't say exercise. Give me the pill, and I'll take that, and everything I, will be I fine. I want the six-pack abs pill. <laughs> don't we all? Oh, my God. The day that comes out. Oh, I'm my God. Gentlemen. When I, I got to invent that. <laughs> that would be awesome i had abs once it was the most obnoxious thing in my entire life because you got to keep them that's the, that's yeah. the problem and they're, they're very difficult they're temperamental yeah and they go away as soon as you eat a and sandwich they, they don't like pasta <laughs> those abs they do not they will run away from if you eat pasta yeah. having abs is all right you know what's better spaghetti <laughs> <laughs> trade-off trade-off man it's yeah. all about a trade-off speaking of trades uh, edgewaterfamilywealth.com they engage in those i met <laughs> that was not a good segue i'll have to do better but edgewaterfamilywealth.com is the website you want to go to to get a hold of scott and tammy and then they plus we have all the past episodes we've got the blog we've got all the financial talks with tammy that you could want to hear i'm promising you that for all your fin heads out there and we'll be right back with more it's only money here on real radio 104.1 Welcome back to It's Only Money here on Real Radio 104.1. And that's right. We're at the last segment of the show. It goes by so fast. Time flies when you're having fun and potentially making money at the same time. Mm. <laughs> but I'm here with from Edgewater Family Wealth, Scott Brown and Tammy. And I, of course, am Ryan and Scott. All right. You said you're talking about last segment. One size doesn't fit all. There's no clear cut answers on what you should do. But there has to be. I mean, other than like, you know, throwing money into a fire. But there has to be like something that you definitely should not do. A mm. one size fits all. Uh, yeah, obviously, it's like, don't throw money in a fire. Yeah. And don't get swindled. Mm -hmm. But they, like, they, you know what I mean? There's got to be something out there that's like, okay, people, a lot of people do this. They should stop immediately. Or have it, or is it, you're going to give me there's no one size fits all answer. Right? I'm not. Well, I'm trying to think of what somebody should definitely. I mean, some of this stuff seems pretty self evident. I think <laughs> gambling mm. um, is something people probably on average should not do a lot of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in drugs are probably not good <laughs> for your <laughs> economics. I mean, I good don't thought. know a lot of wealthy heroin addicts, so that's probably a bad idea. Um, you know, gambling is one that. That's probably one of my pet peeves is gambling. And I have friends. And again, I'm not saying 
the couple that says, hey, we're heading off to Vegas. You know, I got my slot money and he's got his blackjack money and it's, it's how we enjoy our time. Then we go to a show and we have dinner and whatever. That's, I mean, that's fine. And, and I, a lot of people can do that. I don't, gambling has no appeal to me. It bores me to tears. Mm. Um, but I get it. Um, I think people get enjoyment from the challenge of gambling. Um, but on average, people don't win because if they did, there wouldn't be a Vegas. Right. right. Vegas would shut their doors. If- the mathematical odds are right there for you to look at. Yes. <laughs> oh, so all you got to see is that they keep opening casinos to know that they're the ones winning. Mm. Right. Um, so, yeah. So I think gambling is a clear one. I mean, um, I think uh, chasing. I think people on average like to chase. Um, and I tell people, if you read it in the paper, it's too late. Right. Oh, I read mm. in the paper that, um, you know, X, Y, Z is going to go through the roof. You, are you under the impression you're the only one reading the paper <laughs> and that the person who wrote the article isn't a little bit ahead of you? And P.S. The person that told them to write the article isn't a little bit. Ahead, and the person they interviewed isn't a little ahead, on and on mm. and on and on. So by the time and I'm not picking on the general public, I like all of you out there. But the reality is, if you're reading it or your next door neighbors telling you about it, it's probably not new news to the people that do this for a living 24 seven. So I would say chasing is a bad idea. Um, I would say anything that's overly speculative. Look, if you make a, if you do a business transaction or you do anything economic, you make a trade, you make an investment. And I wouldn't call anything in this category an investment. And you're saying to yourself, I'm going to put in a thousand dollars. And I believe that within a year, that'll be a hundred thousand dollars. Ooh. This is if you're saying anything with math that looks like that mm-hmm. or resembles that, it is 99% sh- assured it won't work. Mm. So if you're saying stupid things like that to yourself, first of all, I just told you to stay off the heroin. Mm-hmm. Second of all, I told you not to gamble. And if you're saying things like not gamble a lot, what I'm saying to you is if your belief is that this is going to fix your problems overnight or something resembling overnight, it is probably a, a bad decision. Now, I imagine a lot of people, uh, most people, they do. They, they watch the uh, the CNNs, the Fox, the mm-hmm. MSNBC. That's the one. What's the one for money only? Is that that one? CNBC. CNBC. And that's where they get their information mm-hmm. from. But you're, from what you're saying is you're, you're getting delayed information because the reporters got that. Mm-hmm. Now they're on TV. They're telling you. Now everybody knows it. As as somebody in your career, where are you getting the information from? Is it is is I, I know Tammy's. He's got the charts. He's got the he's got the the math and all the stuff. Are, are you, you're compiling it? Um, no, mm. we don't have the information that you're looking for. Darn it. These are not the drones you're looking for. <laughs> um, we are no. It's it's again. We are compiling the data that is to be compiled, and it is real time. We have the facilities to to get real time data, and um, but you know it's it's that doesn't mean anything in the big scheme of things. We're building investment programs for people that are based on sound principles that have been time tested, and we believe won't make anybody rich overnight, but do believe over time will make them competitive and help them achieve their goals, which I know is not a sexy story, but it is the truth. So if you believe you're going to a financial advisory firm because they know something the one next to them doesn't know, which by the way, whenever you go to any town, they're always like right next to each other. Mm. You know why that is? And lunches. That. And so when the <laughs> brokers quit and go to the other firm, it's a, it's a short walk with all their stuff, right? Uh. So, <laughs> you know, if you believe that the research analyst at XYZ firm is smarter than the research analyst at AB, they're all looking at the same stuff. Mm-hmm. They're all looking at the same data. Tammy can pull up any company in real time and tell you what their earnings are, what they're projected to be. He can tell you what they're, cash to book value is what their earnings per share he can tell you all that real time all day long if even if we know all that technical data all those numbers it doesn't tell us whether their product's going to sell what they what next watch is going to be what scandal their ceo is up to Mm. in the hamptons we don't these are all things that affect the, the numbers don't have anything to do with so again i would argue that that having some kind of data in advance other than illegal data, and they call that insider trading, and they put you in jail for that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no advantage to that at all. In fact, if you think about research, I've thought about this the other day as research analysts. People are people like this analyst or that analyst, Jim Cramer, who's really just a celebrity. He's not an analyst, mm-hmm. right? And we have these analysts that we look up to. Oh, I got to get with the analyst and check the research. Last I checked, the analyst 
isn't wealthy. If the analyst knew what was going to happen to a particular stock or a group of stocks, wouldn't the analyst be really, wouldn't he be or she be the billionaire? Right. right. But it doesn't make Not any sense. Doesn't make any sense that this person has some special insight. Now, does an analyst know details you might be interested in for the long term? Like what new products are coming out? What's the word on the street? What's who's the new CEO going to be? What is the, well, you know, are there, is there a, a lawsuit that may be detrimental down the road? I mean, that information's helpful, uh, but it isn't a crystal ball. So when you confuse analytical research from a firm, whether it's Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch, not even Merrill Lynch, I mean, what are they, Bank of America? I don't even know. <laughs> Who, any of these firms, right? Um, you believe these people in the $3,000 suits know something that is going to make you rich overnight? The answer is no, because they're not rich overnight. That's a that's a valid point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that it is. I never I never th thought about it that way, but that uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna start double checking people. <laughs> but I feel like for you, your whole your whole thing could be like like, well, Scott, how do you know what you're doing? Because I've been doing it for 30 years. I still have a job, <laughs> yeah. and people still come to me, and I'm still doing it. I, that's what I would tell everybody coming through. I, do do you find it's a hard sell for to to be to get to get a client? I mean. No, because people who come to me come uh, more often than not, they come through a referral. They, they, they've had experience with somebody who's had experience with me. I mean, I've, I've had some families for 35 years, you know, so that tells you we must not be complete idiots. Um, <laughs> at least at least Tammy's not. I could be, but I try. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But the reality is, no, because people who come to me most of the time have realistic expectations. They they've heard about how we do business, what our approach is, all the things we talk about day in and day out on the show. They, that appeals to them. They're like, okay, this guy's not selling me, you know, swamp land in the Everglades. This guy's saying, look, this is these are the services we provide. We, you know, people underestimate the administrative side of this business. They underestimate, I need ten thousand dollars. Do I take it from account A or account B? And what are the implications? Because I don't know, right? They underestimate. We have a stock. We have a portfolio of stocks. Two of them are down. Let's harvest that gain, sit on it for thirty-one days, and, and take the tax loss. So that when we have a gain, when we sell a piece of property or another stock, we can offset that tax liability to some degree, a little, a lot, whatever. Yeah. Right? People don't think these parts through. My industry has taught them the things they should be looking for are fast returns. This mutual fund's better than that mutual fund. That annuity is better than this annuity. That advisor is better than the other advisor. Here at XYZ Company, we care about you. <laughs> we love you. We, you know, we're we're nicer. Um, we're smarter. We're are you know are the models we use uh, that are galloping on horses on the beach are better than the models they use that are you know come on really you know the pe people they come to us <laughs> they don't buy that crap mm. right unfortunately most people do you know it's like the political ads right now we're laughing about the political ads so yeah. whatever side you're on you know the the they show the opponent in black and white in yeah. X-ray video, and they're angry. This person, there's always chomping on a cigar and laughing. Mm. Ah, ha, ha. And then they show the candidate in color near a garden with roses. I'm like, I, I said to my wife, "Who's falling for this?" <laughs> and she's like, "Apparently, a lot of people." So anyway, that goes back to advertising, right? Is is my industry has taught you it's about the trade, and the reason they've taught you that is because they want to sell you products and they want you to do trades, right? So. You know, nobody's under the false impression that Big Macs are good for you, but they show the nice, shining, happy family. And, you know, they're eating a Big Mac and they're having a good time. And R Ronald McDonald's there and it's all wonderful, right? You know, your arteries are clogging up, but that's beside the point. So, again, you have to look behind the curtain to some degree. And the people that come to me either are wore out by that process or they never bought it in the first place. Well, I'm hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how good advertising is you start talking about one oh, and i was like hmm that does sound pretty good love the them fries <laughs> <laughs> well we are gonna get out of here you've spent another day another sunday listening to it's only money here on real radio I almost said realradio.com. This is the radio. It's real radio. <laughs> the actual radio. 104.1. We're here. We're doing it. So go to edgewaterfamilywealth.com. You can get all our past episodes. You can get uh, the, the financial talks with Tammy, the blog section, so much good stuff. All of that there is for free. And if you want to email the show, it is edgewaterfamilywealth at raymondjames.com. Uh, gentlemen, it was a pleasure hanging out with you this Sunday. And uh, I, I, we will see you next week. Likewise, until next week. See you soon. All right. You're listening to It's Only Money on Real Radio 104.1.
Yeah, and clearly people are rich, right? Or wealthy. You don't have to be rich. I like the term wealthy better. I mean, to rich reminds me of, like, the Monopoly guy or something. But, you know, they're people. They're regular people. <laughs> that guy I trust. Yeah, see, no. the problem, Scott, you don't have a monocle. Monocle is... Now, if you can meet a guy with a monocle, I mean, like, I'm all in. What was his financial advice? He said, buy park, please? Yeah, I don't... Where is that? Where is that? I can't find it. <laughs> Tune into It's Only Money with Scott Brown from Edgewater Family Wealth. Sunday mornings at 7 on Real Radio 104.1. Raymond James Financial Services, Inc. Member FINRA SIPC. Edgewater Family Wealth is not a broker-dealer. It's independent of RJFS.